evening, Philippians, and we're in uh, the first chapter, Philippians chapter 1, not to be confused with Philemon, where we've been on Wednesday nights. Paul, last week we, we looked at the verses of previous, uh, and he is talking about himself and being in prison. And being in prison for the cause of Christ, and that they had nothing to be, they had nothing to worry about with that. And basically, kind of explaining himself as being in bonds, but then he, he makes a transition and he talks about that because of him being in bonds, they didn't need to be worried about him not having followed Christ or this being a horrible thing and questioning whether or not God had made the right decision with this, because he tells them that. Because of the place I'm in, I'm able to share the gospel to people in the palace. And, you know, because of that, the word is being spread because of those people. And then also, because of me being in prison, others are stepping up and sharing the gospel. Others are stepping up and, and, and doing the things that need to be done. And so because of the position I'm in, I am able to access other people that I was unable to access before. And... There are many others that are doing the work of Christ now. And, uh, as we discussed, you know, multiple people are able to do much more than one person on their own. Because they're in multiple places. And he, he goes and he kind of tells them that, and I don't really, you know, there are those that are doing it for the wrong reasons too. But as long as the gospel of Christ is being furthered, I'm excited for that. I'm happy for that. Now, I'm, I'm ready for it to take place. And, and he knows that everything that goes is for the cause of Christ. And so now he's going to talk about them and, and kind of how it applies to them as well. And he's still going to talk about himself and, and, and how he perceives these things. And he's going to basically talk about what the probably the uh, one of the more uh, known verses in this. Uh, one of the ones we know most probably that we're talking about today is in verse 21. He says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And, th and this is kind of the, I guess you could call it a key verse. I'm not always doing, I don't always do key verses with studies like this, but this is definitely a key verse for what we're doing today. Because what he's going to do is he's going to talk about basically him being alive is serving Christ and furthering the cause of Christ. And then even if he loses his life, that's a gain as well. And he's going to kind of compare these two and, and, and apply it to the Philippians and for us as well as a, a reason for us to be furthering the gospel and, and to be working things and not to fear persecution that may come. Because another thing that doubtless was happening for many when hearing of Paul being thrown in prison, not just with the Philippians but others as well, uh, hearing about that would cause them to worry about themselves. It would cause them to worry about what may happen for themselves. I mean, if, if one of us got thrown in jail for preaching the cause of Christ, immediately we would be thinking, should we keep doing this? I, I, is this worth it? What are we doing here? And Paul is trying to quench those fears, put those fears away, and encourage them to keep doing what is needed and to tell them also that he is excited for where he is and, and fine with what is taking place as well in his own life. And so uh, we're going to study to the end of the chapter today, but before we get started, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given to us and thank you for this opportunity we have to be here in your word, to be studying it, and to learning more about our life for you and the ways that we are to live in you, Lord. I'd ask that you would open your word to our hearts and that our time here would be fruitful, Lord. Pray you be with uh, each soul that is here, that if we are in need of salvation or in need of something else, that we would make the step we would grow in you. As you guide me and direct me as I share your word, and let everything be for your honor, your glory, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 20 says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, 
but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. We see here, he says in the very beginning, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. Basically, Paul is telling us here that his greatest desire, this is what he means by earnest expectation, his greatest desire is to see Christ magnified and, and pushed forth. His name to be it. Uh, his, uh, as he says, his greatest desire, and not only his greatest desire, but also his hope or his confidence. It's not a, a, remember, hope is not a maybe so thing. This is something that you can be confident in. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, well, my greatest de desire and my greatest confidence is Christ. And he says because of his earnest expectation and because of what his hope is, his confidence, he says, in nothing I shall, uh, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Uh, uh, because of where his focus is, because of what he's doing, there's nothing that he is going to be ashamed for what's taking place. Some were probably ashamed to know that Paul was in jail for it. Uh, you know, anything that when something bad happens to somebody, oftentimes we will connect ourselves to it, or especially somebody being thrown in jail for something. The temptation is there to be ashamed of it. I mean, nobody wants to know that a family member or a close friend or somebody you know has been thrown in jail. You don't want that. You don't desire that. Now, you can be very, be very easy to just be ashamed of that taking place. But Paul says that because of my expectation and because of my hope, my confidence, because of where my priorities are, I am not ashamed of this. I have nothing to be ashamed of. Because I know that what I, the reason that I am here is because of Christ. Because I was following Him. I did everything that I was supposed to be doing. And so he says, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. He says, and so I'm going to continue magnifying the name of Christ. I'm going to have boldness in proclaiming his name, in doing the things that I need to be doing for the cause of Christ. I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I'm not going to... Uh, cower away from the opportunities that I have. I'm not going to allow myself to be changed because I'm now in jail. Because of me doing these things put me in this place. Go. You know, I've mentioned lately because I think it puts us all in, in the, the mindset that I hope that the things that are happening in the, the world around us puts you on the mindset of expecting the things of Revelation. If our study through Revelation has not, you have not seen the similarities with our world condition right now in the things of Revelation, then you need to study Revelation more. It should put you in this place. And something that you should expect with the times of Revelation is the Lord's churches not being accepted by society. You should expect this. And the temptation, though, whenever this comes, is for us to be ashamed of where we stand. When there is persecution, and, and you know, we still experience it on a lower level today. But to be very confident in our mission, in our goal. If we know that our goal is Christ, and our goal is to serve Him, then, and that is our greatest expectation, that is where our confidence lies, that will put us in a position to where we do not become ashamed of who we stand for, of what we teach. 
It puts us in a position to continue being bold in this. Paul, he, he said that uh, with all boldness, as always, that Christ is going to be magnified. He had already been working and doing things to magnify the name of Christ, and he is continuing in that. Because of where his priorities lie. Because of what he is focused on. You notice here he says, by life or my death. And the thing he knows as well is, he is going, his, the name of Christ is going to be magnified. Whether he continues living or whether his life ends. You know, for the context of this, I mean, you look in, as we talked about last week, with people being inspired to share the gospel because of what was happening in Christ. His death, I'm sure, whenever it did eventually happen, it inspired many more to action. The name of Christ was shown even then. You know, there were those that were converted because of Christ being on the cross. God, we had the, uh, the thief on the cross that was converted, knowing full well that Christ had no business being there. God, we, even, we don't know if Pilate was ever um, converted, but you, you see Pilate and you see that he knew that Christ did not deserve to be there. He knew that something was different from Christ. There were others that had to have made the same connection. Uh, even Peter, because of all that that happened, you know, Peter himself, I think, grew from that. So he says, no matter what, Christ will be magnified. But also, for himself, he knows that either route is good. He, he knows here that he is not sacrificing himself for this. That, or that he's not losing out in this. Either direction he gains. Because he says in verse 21, for to me it to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. His whole purpose in living is for the cause of Christ. To see the glory of Christ. He talked about, just as we saw, his expectation and his hope is for Christ to be magnified. So for him, being that his greatest desire and his greatest confidence is seeing Christ magnified, and being alive, he gets to do more to further his greatest desire. His greatest want. So in living... He's going to live his life for the cause of Christ. He's going to live his life to point to Christ. To spread the gospel of Christ. He's going to talk a little bit later about it, it, him being able to stay on earth. Gives him the opportunity to minister to people like the Philippians. And to help them and encourage them. His life's purpose is Christ. So he's, that's what he'd do if he lives. But if he dies, well, that is gain. How is it gain? Because he spends eternity with Christ. He leaves this present world. He no longer has to live in a sinful body. He gains his reward. You know, many would look at Paul and for him to say, well, if I'm alive, I'm doing all this for Christ. And I'm okay with dying, too. And he says, I'm okay living in this lifestyle, and I'm okay dying, too. And people would think, oh, yeah, you're sacrificing everything, and you're welcome. we're willing to just lose your life, too. And, you know, 
I don't think in any of this that Paul is suicidal. He's not suicidal. That's all he's talking about here. That he's, you know, thinking about trying to die. And he's going to talk about that a little more, and basically he says he doesn't know which one he thinks would be the greatest. And but you we would look at it, or many could we could look at it and, and say Christ or Christ. Paul is sacrificing all this, is losing all of this. But for Paul, because of where his priorities lie, or, or were, both were of extreme value. Dying isn't bad because he goes to heaven. Living for Christ, even though he loses all that the world would seem valuable, Paul sees the value of Christ and his gospel being spread. The gospel of Christ being spread. So both are a great joy to him. You know, some in prison would maybe decide they didn't want to live for Christ anymore. Many throughout history, when given the opportunity, were given the have been given the opportunity to renounce Christ in order to curb the punishments of following Christ. But Paul says, I'm going to continue with it. Because he sees the fruit. Verse 22, we see why he wants to continue living with Christ. He says, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. He says, if I continue to live in the flesh, if this continues, if I'm allowed to stay here, there is a fruit to my labor. There's something that is going to come. But he says, yet, what shall I choose? I what not. He says, but there is a, 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 he says, whether I'm going to live or whether I'm going to die, he says, I don't know which one would be greatest, which one I think would be the most beneficial. Because he says in 23, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. It says, I'm on a path, and there are two different choices that would be laid, that could be laid before me. And I don't really know which one I would choose. If it were left to me to decide, and remember this, Paul is all about following the will of Christ. So he's not here sitting here thinking, do I want to stay alive or do I want to die? Basically what he's saying is if it were left up to me to choose, I don't know which one would be the better option. And the reason for this is basically he's saying I'd either choose between myself or I'd choose between other people here. And even in the choosing himself, he would be with Christ because he says, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. He says, my first desire is to be able to leave this world and to be with Christ. He wants to see his Savior. He wants to see his Lord and interact with him and be with him and leave this place because of the sin that exists here. And he knows, hey, when he says here, which is far better, he knows that this is probably the far better option for himself and his suffering and his pain, of course, leaving the fleshly body and no longer having to worry about any uh, problems, the flesh, the thorn in his flesh is, would be subsided them. He knows that this is a, a selfish reason would, would be much better. But notice what he says here. He says in verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The fruit of his labor would be that he is able to increase other people, that others would be able to benefit from him being there. He is willing. He's saying uh, there is the option for there would be the option for me to further limit myself and to bring suffering upon myself somewhat. But what that would do is that would bring 
help for you. I will be able to encourage you. He knows that they will benefit from him, and not just the Philippians, but all. He says in 25, nevertheless, to abide in the, or 20, I was reading 24, 25, he says, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, all, with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. So he says, and if he abides, and what he means here is if Christ continues me, his confidence he knows what will happen is that he will work to continue with them. He's going to stay with them. He's going to keep working. He's not going to give up on them. He's not going to stop. He's going to work for their furnace, for them to grow, and for them to have an increase of joy and faith. An increase of, of, of gladness and being stronger in the Lord and following him. I want us to think about this for a second. Paul is saying that whichever option Christ gives to him, he would be excited to go to heaven, but if he's left here, he's going to make sure that his time is spent doing things for other people, increasing the gospel of Christ and increasing other people. He's not going to waste his time being here. I wonder how many of us can look at our lives and see an increase in the gospel of Christ and an increase in other people due to us still being here on this earth. What is being done by you being here still to increase the gospel of Christ and to see other people grow? What are you doing to accomplish that goal? I think there are many that, after spending a, a great deal of time in doing something, we get to this mindset that we no longer have to do that anymore. And I'm not saying that this doesn't just happen with people that are older in their years. This happens with people that are young that spend a, a, an amount of time in doing the same thing and think they don't need to do it anymore. We think that just because we've done what we would deem to be our due diligence that we can stop now. The only time that we stop doing one activity for the cause of Christ is to change to another activity that is more beneficial to us. And not necessarily beneficial to us, but beneficial to the cause of Christ. The standard for when our work here on earth is done is when we go to be with Christ. It is when Christ returns or you are called home individually. That's when it happens. But until that point, there needs to be a confidence. We need to remember that we still have things to do to increase Christ and those around us. There is no retirement from the cause of Christ. There may be a change in what you do for the cause of Christ, but there is no retirement from the cause of Christ. It's sad that so many come to the, uh, the point where they feel as if they are worthy to retire from serving Christ. It's just not true. There's nowhere in Scripture for this. Paul, at this point in his life, uh, some uh, you know, think that he may have been in his the 60s at this point. We don't really have an exact time frame because we never really give him Paul's uh, age at any point in time. The only thing we have is early on, it, it describes him, it, when the, at the stoning of Stephen, it describes him as being a young man. But 
the uh, traditions of the time. So Sandra Tom young man can cover a very large amount of time. But Paul at this time was in his 60s, and remember this, our lifespan is longer than it was during Paul's time. Paul in his 60s was a very old man by those standards. And he's saying, I have all the confidence that I am going to continue and working to further everyone else in the gospel of Christ. He's saying this from jail, too. In a place where many would feel very unable to do anything for Christ. Verse 26, he says, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Notice here what he, he talks about as well. If he is able to come to them again. He wants their rejoicing to be more abundant in Jesus Christ than in him. You know, it is a sad thing that there are people that they do not grow in Christ, they grow in a person that they are following. There are times where a, a pastor will leave a church and there will be people that will leave the church because the pastor left. And when that happens, they were not growing in Christ, they were growing in that person. And there are times where it is not the pastor's fault that those people did that. It's nothing that the pastor did. It's them following the person. We see this with the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, you see that Paul writes to them. And he talks to them. And they, the problem, one of the problems that existed there was divided. Because some were saying, I am a Paul. I am a, a Paulus. I am a Peter. Some were even saying, I am of Christ. They're saying the people that they were saved under. Or they followed. And it making them a great, greater or, or better or all of whatever they were saying about it. But they are being divided because of the people that they were following. Or they were saying they were of. And there was probably plenty of people that in the case of Paul that were excited for Paul. And Paul says, my desire is for you not to be excited in me just because I am coming. Or just because of me. I want you to be excited for me because you know it will bring you to a more excitement for Christ. Be excited for Christ. Don't do these things. Don't act this way. Don't respond in this way just because of a person that is standing before you. Or because of what a person said. Do it for the cause of Christ. Don't seek out people because of their qualifications or because of the way that they act. Seek them out because of the way that they lead you to Christ and the way that your relationship with Christ grows. Now, the example that Brother Ron brought this morning of the, the church that had their many qualifications for their pastor that they were going to announce. And none of them had anything to do with anything spiritual with what he was teaching or how he was going to lead them. You know, they were looking for a man to follow. And, you know, a, a church is supposed to follow their pastor. But they're supposed to follow their pastor to Christ. It is about going to Christ, not about just following a man. Even though pastors are uh, seen in Scripture as being the under-shepherd, it is all about going to the true shepherd. The pastor is not the true shepherd. He is not the shepherd. He is the leader to the shepherd. There should always be the desire to grow closer to Christ and to rejoice about close coming because they're going to lead you to Christ. So I sat before with people that were looking for an evangelist to come and preach at the revival. 
And some of the reasons that were given, and I've heard it from other churches as well, some of the reasons for given of having somebody come is because, well, I haven't heard them in a while, or I've never heard this person before. Or aren't they like a, a family member to you? Even times where they pick them just because of the distance that they are. The way of choosing an evangelist for a revival or any speaking time should be prayerfully considering how are they going to lead us to Christ? How are they going to encourage us to Christ? Makes me sad whenever I hear of times where speakers or evangelists are picked between because of reasons that have nothing to do with Christ. It's because of, well, we got to have a young guy, a middle-aged guy, and an older guy. It needs to be with the desire of how are they going to lead us to Christ. How are they going to encourage us to cross? Be excited for the man and how he changes your relationship with Christ. Not in how that person is. His personality or his attitude. The way he speaks. Or his background. Or his social status. It's sad that so many choose a church and thereby choose a pastor to attend, to listen to, because of the events that happen at the church. Because of the people that go to the church. There are churches that are established on having peaceful people of social status there. Pastors that their desire is to get people of social status at the church. It's a club. There's no encouraging to Christ that happens. There is any, it's very little. Because the focus is in somewhere else. Paul tells them, do not be worried about these other things. Be worried about the cause of Christ. Because this is what I want. He says in 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I came and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. When he uses this word conversation, it means lifestyle. What he says is what your lifestyle needs to be is as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Or your lifestyle, the way that you act, needs to always be about furthering the cross. It needs to be about the gospel of Christ. Your lifestyle needs to be built around it. It is sad that so many build Christ into their lifestyle instead of building their lifestyle into Christ. And this is why we see so many people that they attend church when they have nothing else that is going on. When it is convenient. If something else pops up. If work is too much. If there are activities that they want to attend. They don't have time for church. Because their lifestyle has Christ entered into it instead of their lifestyle into Christ. Some of you may have been seen the example of the, the jar. And you had the, the large rocks, the small stones, and then the sand. And then if you take the sand and dump that in, and then you take the small rocks and dump those in, you don't have enough room for all of the contents. Because the, the big rocks, they, they'll overflow. But if you take the large rocks and you dump those in first, and then you dump the smaller stones in, 
And then you dump the sand in. The sand and the smaller stones, they form around the larger rocks. And there's room for it. What's sad is that so many people add the sand and the smaller stones, the aspects of our life, before adding Christ into their life. And then Christ doesn't fit. Our lifestyle, our conversation needs to be about Christ. It needs to be what furthers it. The decisions that we make. You know, Paul, in talking about saying he had the two decisions. He said, I, I, I can either die and go to be with Christ or I can stay and I can further you and I can do these other things for the gospel. That is somebody whose lifestyle, whose priority in life was Christ. He first chose the things of Christ and then everything else. He wasn't concerned with what was going on around him and those other things unless it had something to do with the cause of Christ. Now there are things in our lives that are, are not bad. This life is here for us to enjoy, but in the context of living for Christ. And it's not wrong to watch movies and to uh, watch sports. But what is sad is that oftentimes those movies or those sports take the place of Christ. Take the place of the things of Christ. something here. This is being written to the Philippians. And we see no indication of this, that this is elders of the church only or pastors of the church only. This is for all of the Philippians. You know, it's sad that there are people in the Lord's churches that hold their pastors, or their deacons, or they would consider to be their elders of the church to the standard of living the lifestyle of Christ, but they themselves do not live the lifestyle of Christ. I'd be flabbergasted if the pastor missed church to go to the sports game multiple times a year. be flabbergasted if the pastor just woke up once morning and said, well, I just don't feel like going today because I'm tired. They'd raise a ruckus. They'd probably call for him to be fine. Because they would say that the pastor is not concerned with the things of Christ. They'd say if the pastor is not living, they wouldn't use these words, but they'd say the pastor is not living the lifestyle of Christ. But they themselves are not living the lifestyle of Christ. Are pastors held to a higher standard because of the position that they're in in Christ's eyes? Yes. But what is right and what is wrong is no different for a pastor and for a churchman. It is no different. What is wrong for a pastor to be doing is wrong for a church member to be doing. If you would be upset with a person in a position within a church doing something, you need to also be upset with you yourself doing those things. Let your conversation be as that what furthers the gospel. Because he says here, as he continues, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, 
I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. If we want to see the furtherance of the gospel, if we want to see the growth of the gospel, if we want to see the growth of our church, if you want to see the growth of people around you in Christ, you yourself need to have the lifestyle of the gospel. You know, a, a pastor can do a lot of things, but if the entirety of the church is not doing the lifestyle of Christ, it's not going to have the personality of that. You're not going to see that growth. Paul says that in order for me to be able to hear about you standing fast together, being united together, striving together, and seeing the gospel spread, is that you yourselves are living this lifestyle. When you look in Scripture, what is the method of church outreach and seeing growth happen? Somebody goes to someone, shares the gospel, that person shares the gospel with their house and the whole household is saved. And then that household goes and finds another group of people and that household is saved. And then another household goes and they go and they go and they go and they talk to the people that they know, they invite the people that they know. They make connections with them. That is the most efficient form of spreading the gospel when church is growing. That is the scriptural form for it. Do I condemn those that do that, that go to and, and knock on doors and those that send out flyers and those that leave tracks? No, because they do things. They do reach people. But they are very, very, very inefficient. The most efficient form of growth is when the entire church is consumed with the lifestyle of Christ and spreading it to everybody that they know. That's the most efficient form. Churches that grow spiritually, that grow truly to the cause of Christ, are those where the entirety of the church is living a lifestyle of Christ. Just a, a few months ago, I guess it's been six months now because I did it right, I started it right at the beginning of COVID. I did a series on an exploding church and we looked in Acts chapter 2 in the, the church of Jerusalem and the way it just kind of blew up. If you remember it, looking at that, we saw those characteristics of people that were consumed with the lifestyle of Christ and was spreading the lifestyle of Christ. And that's why it exploded. And here's the thing as well with him. He says that they would stand fast in one spirit. You know, no church has ever been split because the church was united in Christ. Because everybody was following Christ. It's never happened. The reasons that churches split is because one side or both sides stopped following Christ. Stopped living for Christ. Stopped being consumed with Christ. It is a fact. Because those that are consumed with Christ are united. Those that are consumed with the lifestyle of Christ stand fast together, no matter what. says, and nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. He tells them that if you are consumed with this lifestyle of Christ, there is nothing for you to be terrified of. There is nothing for you to fear. 
You do not need to worry about your adversaries. You do not have to worry about those that are coming because it will not bother you what they do. He doesn't say that it's not going to happen. It would be bonkers for him to say that your, ter your adversaries are not going to do anything to you because he's sitting in jail right now. What we tell them is no matter what they do, you're not going to be worried about it. You're not going to be terrified of it. You're just going to know, I need to do this because I'm consumed with Christ, so I'm going to keep doing it. You're not going to be worried about the people and the ways that they may attack you with their words or their actions. You're going to be consumed with the cause of Christ. We will be consumed with that. So we don't need to be terrified. They were probably some that were terrified because of what had happened to Paul. And Paul was telling them, if you're consumed with Christ and you're united together, you have nothing to fear. The fear will be quenched. It will be done by our relationship with Christ and the Holy Spirit strengthening us, but also by each other strengthening ourselves. By us working together, of us supporting each other because we're united together. It'll prove their sin, but it'll be our strengthening cause. You know, it is sad that we are in America and we are free to worship. It's in our constitution that we have the freedom of religion. And we've experienced that for many years, a few generations. But there are those that are in other countries that do not experience the freedom that are much more dedicated to the cause of Christ. And I'm not saying we need to pray that we are persecuted and that everything just goes down the drain. But you need to realize also that times of trial or times of ways that we are hindered for the cause of Christ should strengthen us to the cause of Christ. Should push us to the cause of Christ. When we go through times that are hard, we go through times of trial, they should push us closer to Christ. By the way, to us, and when he says here, but to you of salvation, he's not talking about salvation from our sins, he's talking about our strengthening. And it'll even prove our salvation to us. He's talking about it, our, our strengthening, our, our lifting up. And it will also prove that of God, the things that are of God. It will make those things greater for us. So what can we do with these things? Notice verse 29, he says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sin, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. You know, many people in Philippians and hearing of Paul being thrown in prison probably wanted a letter that said, don't worry guys, this is just me that's going to get thrown in jail. This is just me that's going to be persecuted for calling cross. But what does Paul say? He says, the same conflict which he saw in me now here to be in me. And so, he, or, Verse 29, sorry. He says, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. He says, you are going to have the same conflict. You are going to have the same problems. Do not think yourself exempt from these things. If you are following the cause of Christ, you are going to experience these things. When was the last time you were rejected for the cause of Christ? Because Christ said it as well. If you are serving me, if you are doing things that aren't, they hated me first, they're going to hate you as well. 
When was the last time you were rejected for the cause of Christ? If it's been a long time, it's because you weren't living for Christ. Weren't living enough for Him. Things are not supposed to be easy. But we can be excited for it. Because it brings us closer together. It strengthens us. As he said in 28, but to you salvation and that of God. It strengthens us together and it strengthens our relationship in God. Proves it to us. Makes it great. It can bring us joy. You know, Paul is, as I said, he's going to talk in Philippians. He's already talked about some about there being joy in problems. That there being strength in troubles. Even when things are hard for the cause of Christ, even when we are rejected for the cause of Christ, if we are following Christ and we're doing things the way that Christ has told us to do and we're living that lifestyle, it will bring us the joy as well. But you will only see it you will only experience it if you have a lifestyle of Christ. It's easier said than done. As much easier said than done to live the lifestyle of Christ. To be consumed with those things. But it needs to be what we strive for. It needs to be what your goal is. And the easiest way to do that is to start Prioritizing the things in your life. Prioritize the things of Christ. The things that we want to be our lifestyle, we prioritize it. If you want your lifestyle to be one that is rich and wealthy, you prioritize a job that gets you tons of money, and you prioritize making that money grow or holding on to that money. If your priority if someone's priority is to be a famous sports star, then they make steps and they make decisions and they choose things that take them to that goal. If you want to make your priority that of the lifestyle of Christ, you need to make the priority. You need to choose things that bring you towards that goal. Choosing the things of the church. Choosing the things of God's word. Choosing God's word. Just make the decision for some things. And you'll see that there'll be more things that you make a decision of. Keep flowing. And you'll keep growing. And your lifestyle will change. Or, if you already have Christ as your priority, your lifestyle will grow in Christ. Paul's lifestyle in Christ continued to grow all the way up until the moment that he died. Do not allow yourself to think that there is a time where you can retire from the lifestyle of Christ. Don't think yourself to be able to be at the point to retire from Christ and his work. This just doesn't happen. Keep prioritizing things that are for Christ, not things that are of ourselves, of our own choice. Live it. Can you say of yourself, to live is Christ, and to die is gain? Or is it to live is gain, and to die is gain? And this is the thing as well. I don't think Paul thought he was losing everything that he wanted in living for Christ. Because his lifestyle was of Christ, he gained everything on earth that he wanted as well. He got to see people grow. He got to see people encouraged. He got to see people accept Christ. Let's go ahead and enter into our time of prayer. Now is the time to respond to God's Word. Maybe there are some things that you need to prioritize for Christ. 
Maybe there's some things that you keep saying, well, I'm gonna, I'll do it if I can, or I'll do it when I get around to it. Maybe you need to prioritize it. Think on those things and think request of the Lord to uh, help you to prioritize those things. Maybe what you need to do to start your priorities for Christ is you need to accept Him as your personal Lord and Savior. You don't, you, maybe you're, you're questioning whether or not the lifestyle of Christ is all that great or whether that lifestyle of Christ is a good thing. Well, if you start that lifestyle in Him, and by accepting Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you start that lifestyle, you'll begin to see how great it is. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, you're saying, I don't know if I can prioritize life, Christ in my lifestyle. I don't know if I can make a lifestyle of Christ. Pick a few things. Prioritize those and see what happens. And once you got those prioritized, find some more things to prioritize. Work on converting your lifestyle or encouraging your lifestyle to be that of Christ.